So if I go back to this first screen again, what I want to do is to, to illustrate some of these ideas that we care about. So we talk about having 5,000 targets associated to GBM. Yeah, just so to clarify what a target means, it's basically a gene or a protein that we're looking for, right? Okay. So in instance, for glioblastoma stem cells, we need to find those targets. Uh, it's basically like turning a gene on and off. So we want to find drugs that are able to do that and target the glioblastoma stem cells, just yeah. the clarification. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and as a cancer researcher, you probably know um, some of these targets well because that's your area of research, so for example, yeah. glioblastoma stem cells. But there's others that you won't know about that it's presenting to you. And the important thing that we realize is the interconnectedness between all this information, the interconnectedness between these different groups is fundamental to be able to understand um, basically the mechanisms within the disease. But it's a lot of information, right? 5,000 targets, just to put that into perspective, there's 20,000 known genes in the human genome. So to say that a quarter of the entire genome is a potential target for a cure, it's just not practical, it's impossible. So what we want to do is we want to be able to understand, actually, can we start to use this information to focus that? So what I've got here, and what we've got as another um, part of the platform, is a network view. So I'm just going to uh, quickly let this lay out. Uh, and then start to show as it expands. And what you're looking at here is essentially we've taken those targets for GBM, these genes and these proteins, and we've laid it out as a network. So you're looking at what we consider to be the glioblastoma network for the disease. And why this is important, if I just stop it here, is each one of these dots, each one of these nodes represents one of those gene proteins, those targets, and the information, uh, these edges, is connections between them that we know to be true today about the disease. And what you can see is that there's shaded areas, so clusters of these genes that we care about, that may be specific, for example, to glioblastoma. Right. So these may be the targets I care about. But what you don't see from other views and why this is quite uh, powerful is I can start to see that how do these orange nodes, which may represent one of the things I care about, connect with the other sides of the disease? Because it's probably between those two that we care about to find those answers. So really what this is, is the starting point to understand glioblastoma in its entirety, and then from that information, we can start to ask questions to focus in specifically on some of those pieces, and then really take that onto the next part of the platform, which we're going to talk about now. Which yeah. is really at the heart of the disease sprint and the target identification process, which is what we're currently running in between our Cambridge, London, and New York offices. This way. So if we can take the slide on one more. So the disease sprint while we're doing this involves a cross-functional team of 26 machine learning researchers, drug discoverers, and software developers, product managers, and data scientists all working in you know, cross-functional squads using different data, different models, different theories to interrogate that data and tailor the machine learning models to, um, to understand and reason across all that data and to uncover new insights that we can use to developing these new treatments. So we all know that somewhere in this vast you know, corpus of biological data that there's a new way of looking at glioblastoma and how do we attack those stem cells? How do we stop them from replicating and creating new tumors? And that is the process that we're undergoing in this disease sprint. This process is so important because you know, these five different research teams are all working on different models and interrogating that data in unique ways. And now we're going to show you how that I guess behind me, we're showing you how that actually works in practice. Okay. Yeah, so we have been talking about like glioblastoma, right? So, but that's a big challenge to take. We wanted to focus on something that's really important. And like we explained, glioblastoma stem cells are the root of the cancer. So we wanted to focus on finding targets that would impact the glioblastoma stem cells. And that's what we focused during the disease sprint. And uh, yeah, so that was our main focus. And then I guess I, I'm going to ask Ollie how we um, make sense of all this ingested data and contextualize it and so that we can really identify the genes that are involved in the stem cell um, recreation of that tumor and how do we stop that using the, the molecule that we're designing that modulates that target. Sure. Um, so yeah, during this disease sprint, uh, our teams worked on five different ways in parallel of doing exactly that, of trying to find novel ways of attacking these stem cells at the heart of these tumors. Um, and we're going to show just a couple of them now uh, on this complicated layer that we drew earlier. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll show two sort of complementary ways that we use to, to come up with new treatments. You don't need to worry about all the details on this thing. It is a complicated thing. 
Um, so Jamie was showing you earlier uh, a tool that was sitting on top of our graph, this knowledge base of millions of entities and billions of relationships that connect all of biology together. And so he was talking about how a scientist can use this tool, and I'll t tell you for a little bit uh, what our machines can do. So they also work on top of this and come up with sort of insights and things for us. They also created large parts of it themselves, and they created it using natural language processing algorithms in order to read the scientific literature. So I'll just show you a small example of what that actually looks like. So, so here's a sentence uh, that comes from a paper from a couple of years ago. It's talking about these stem cells and this uh, archaeate scoot homolog one gene, and it's expressing that there is a relationship between these two things. This gene is more active uh, in these stem cells, uh, as discovered by these scientists. Um, you can draw your own conclusions as to whether this is an easy sentence for you to digest or not. Uh, I think uh, Pajita would say this is quite a straightforward statement <laughs> in the literature. Um, but one of the interesting things about the scientific literature is that scientists actually have to be quite careful about what they say. Uh, they don't want to say things that don't have evidence. Uh, and so, what they end up with is all kinds of language that's actually quite different to how you would see it uh, if you were uh, reading in, in web pages or Wikipedia or other places like that. And so what we've done is we've trained our natural language algorithms using millions of sentences, and we've linked them to things that are known. And that way we're exposing our algorithms to all the different way that scientists in particular are expressing these relations. And so what we have on the right here is what our, our algorithms have extracted, they've noticed that we've got this cell and this gene, and there's this relationship between them. There's all kinds of different relationships that there can be between them. And so if you imagine, if we did it on not just one sentence or a million sentence or a billion sentences, that you'll start to build up a whole graph, a sort of connected uh, set of nodes and edges that make uh, a beautiful sort of combination that shows uh, what biology looks like. Uh, well. It's not, it's not that beautiful, really. Uh, it, <laughs> it looks, actually, to me, it looks like a little bit of a mess, doesn't it? Well, biology is a mess, so I wouldn't be surprised that it is like that. Yeah. Well, that's uh, reassuring, I, I, I hope. Um, and yet, <laughs> the graph is incomplete, because if actually we had a cure for glioblastoma, it would be somewhere on here already, and it's not. So we need something on top of this to be able to complete this graph. We want to be able to use it to generate new ideas. And so we have another family of machine learning algorithms that are doing this uh, link prediction. So what we want to do is train AI algorithms that can identify what's logical, uh, but what's not already been explicitly stated. It's an active area of machine learning research, and there's all kinds of sophisticated models that so you'll be relieved I won't be going into too, too much detail. Um, we have got one model that we use for this. It's called uh, Optimus Prime. Yeah, we're, uh, we're big fans of transformers, and clearly Optimus Prime is the best transformer, hands down. <coughs> That's maybe not true, but we don't need no, to worry about true. that. It's true. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go into any details, but what, what Optimus Prime does is it learns the representation of the structure of this whole graph. In general, how do entities of a particular kind, say a cell or a stem cell, relate to other entities such as a gene? Um, and once this has been trained, we can then deploy it on the things that we care about. We can plug in genes that we know that we can uh, create drugs for. Uh, we can plug in genes that are related to these stem cells, and we get a prediction score for each one of them. So that's quite cool. And yet, it's not, e it's not actually enough for our very demanding scientists all the time. That's actually quite true, actually. We, we do have a lot of requests for our machine learning and technology guys all the time. But, but honestly, you, you have such a massive graph, right? So I'm thinking as a scientist, you have so much information. How do I find the right targets for glioblastoma stem cells? How do I, I mean, how does the model actually traverse from going from a node, which is GBM, to actually finding the right target that is glioblastoma stem cells? So, we as scientists need to know how you make that inference of a target to be able to confidently say that this is actually a right interpretation. So that was my request, and I think that's logical, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've probably heard about the six degrees of separation, that, that theory by which 
any two of us, me and any of you, are somehow related by six or so acquaintance uh, links, perhaps involving Kevin Bacon, because for some reason he's connected to everyone, mostly A-listers, not myself, I have to say. Um, and what we find is that there's actually quite a few Kevin Bacon genes and things in biology as well. You've got various areas that are just connected with everything. And so paths that go through those sort of those big uh, hubs uh, would be immediately suspicious to a scientist yeah. such as uh, Pajita. And so we introduced a further model that makes predictions by doing exactly this sort of hopping around the graph, going from something that we know to something that we don't know. Um, and so this model gets rewarded when it does things well and it gets punished when it doesn't do things so well. Um, and we know whether it did well or not because we use our original Optimus Prime model to, uh, to say whether it was a, a good idea or not. So in some ways we have one AI model teaching another one, which is kind of cool. What so it also what does... Looking, like, can you explain a bit? Because as a scientist, I want to like, think that the path that the model takes in the figure below, like there, you want to go through the golden path, right, where it's connected to GBM and GSE and then arrives at the target. Is that what you mean by rewarding the right path? Yes, so, so there are some paths that you want, to, you. you want to go through, and there's some other paths which are not leading you anywhere very interesting. Right. And so we have a, a so-called reinforcement learning model, which is, is continually being rewarded or punished, but depending on, on, on whether it's uh, doing well. Um, what it does do is it it gets away from the sort of black box issue with AI where you just have a prediction and a score and go, ta-da, there's your score. Uh, and then the scientist is unsure what to do with it. So here we have a model that is both showing you a prediction, but it's also showing some of its working that allows the scientist to be able to make uh, a genuine judgment as to whether, whether to go forward with it. So this is just one of those workflows that we talked about. It's a literature-based discovery. Um, and so while we're looking at that, it's not the only way that you would choose to treat glioblastoma. Um, if you actually want to look at a complicated disease like this, it would be crazy not to uh, look at the patient data that we have for that disease and, and do other things. So while my team was working in the disease sprint on, on this area, um, another team was working on exactly that, of using patient data.